Well, good morning. Welcome to Bethel Church. We are delighted that you are here today. God bless you. We are in a series right now called What's in a Name? And we are looking at the names that were given to Jesus according to Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. And throughout scripture, there are hundreds of names and hundreds of titles that were attributed to Christ. We're just studying a few of them in this series. The name uh, or title that you attribute to somebody is very important because it denotes much about the relationship that you have with that person. In my life, I have a man in my life named Harley Allen. While others call him pastor and others call him mister and others call him sir, I call him dad. And it tells you a lot about the relationship that I have with that man because of the title that I give him. In uh, the earlier service, uh, both of my boys were here, Ryan and Andrew, and to both of them I attribute the title son, and other names and titles go along with that. Not head, get over here, and some of those types of things. Hey you, get over here. <laughs> but the title son tells you much about the relationship that I have with those two boys. I've been living with a lady for 30 years, and thankfully she bears the title wife. Aren't you glad? that the lady I've been living with, I'm married to. Isn't that a great thing? <laughs> Hallelujah for that. The titles that we attribute tell much about the relationship that we have. Jesus himself said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and then not do the things I say? Because when we attribute the title Lord, there are some responsibilities that we have there. There are some other people in this world and they just say of Jesus that he was a great man that he was a great teacher, that he was a moral man. And each of those, they are denoting what their relationship is like with Jesus, that it is a distant relationship because they see him as something less than he is. And in this study, we are revealing the titles and the names of Jesus. And these are so important to us as individuals because each of them has a threefold significance in our lives. The first one is that it reveals an aspect of who Jesus is. And I just want to say that as we are looking at the names of Jesus, you don't get to pick and choose the ones that you like and accept those. This simply is who Jesus is. This isn't a cosmic smorgasbord where you're getting to pick who Jesus is. This is who Jesus is, and all of these aspects are true of him in each life in which he is the Lord. The second thing is that the name or the title reveals a key principle that we need to apply to our life. And the third thing is that each name or title reveals our responsibility in relationship with Jesus. The first week we talked about the word wonderful, that Jesus is wonderful because he takes care of the dullness of our life. The second week we considered the title counselor because he takes care of the decisions of life. Then we talked on our third week about mighty God because he takes care of the demands of life. And today I want to talk to you about the title Everlasting Father. Everlasting Father. Isaiah 9, 6 says this, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. Now, I spent a lot of time developing that sentence and those thoughts on the very first week of this series. If you missed that, you can get that on our website under our sermons tab. But I spent a lot of time developing that sentence. The scripture continues, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Jesus' name includes the title Everlasting Father because he takes care of the dimensions of life. The dimensions of life. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, bears the title Everlasting Father, and this appears to be a theological contradiction that you could have the Son all of a sudden being the Father. Now, in in the Trinity, in the triune Godhead, there are three characters that make up God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Each of them is a separate entity, and they come together to make one complete God. The Father can't be the Son, nor can the Son be the Father, so there is a different uh, meaning that is at work here. The answer, of course, is the use of the word Father. 
Isaiah, when he was writing this passage in the Old Testament, the word father was recognized to have two meanings. The two meanings of this word father were, number one, the originator of, and secondly, the author of. So what is being said of Jesus here is that he is the author of eternity, or he is the originator of eternity. This idea of giving these names, uh, author of or originator of, Jesus in John 8, when he called Satan the father of all lies, he was saying he was the originator of all lies or the initiator of all lies. In Genesis 4, 20, Jabal was called the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. And in Genesis 17, 5, God changed Abram's name to Abraham, the father of many nations. In calling Jesus the everlasting father, he's saying that he is the originator of eternity. He is the originator of forever. And this topic has been a struggle for me to get ready to preach to you. It's been a struggle for me to get ready to preach to you for two reasons. One of them is because of me, and one of them is because of my listening audience. The first thing is that I struggle within myself on these topics of what's eternal and what's temporal. Just last week, I was saying to God, God, I don't understand why you are allowing this to take place. Now, God, I want to talk to you about why it should be this way. Everything that I was talking to God about was temporal. God sees things differently than I do, and we're going to jump into this lesson, and we're going to talk about eternity, and we're going to talk about God's perspective, even on my life, and how he always has an eternal perspective, even on my temporal issues. The second reason that this topic has been difficult for me to prepare for is because I live in a land today that suicide is seen as a solution for temporal issues. That people are willing to end their life over difficult situations and dead-end circumstances. They are willing to kill themselves. And to a generation that sees suicide as a solution to the point that suicide has become the number two killer of our teens, in a day like that, I'm going to stand up today And I am going to remind you about forever. Friends, I know that there are people that you interact with and that I interact with that don't want to see another sunrise, let alone hear that they're going to live forever. But the fact of the matter is, eternity is a real live issue that needs to be addressed. Why? Because the title that he bears in Isaiah 9, 6 is Everlasting Father, the originator of, the initiator of, the everlasting. So we're going to talk about the eternal today. And please, you're not going to get any condemnation from me today if you're struggling with temporal events in your life. I'm a fellow struggler. I get that. I'm not going to come down on you because you're worried about a doctor's report or a PG&E bill or something else that's going on in your life while you deal with the, uh, the temporal. I want to bring some encouragement to you today about the eternal perspective that God has and how that affects your decision making even this week in the temporal setting that you find yourself in. So the eternal is one of those subjects that I would say is almost impossible for the human mind to even be able to grasp. Man is a beginning, but man has no ending. That's not like God. You see, God's eternal. He has no beginning and he has no end. He's always been and he always will be. That's not how we are. We have a start, but we have no ending You will live on forever beyond the 60 or 70 or 80 years that God grants you on this earth. That is just a down payment on how long you're going to live. Man will live forever. And you're either going to live with God forever or apart from God forever. And those choices belong solely to you. The Puritan preacher Thomas Watson said this, Eternity to the godly is a day that has no sunset. 
and eternity to the wicked is a night that has no sunrise. It only makes sense that since God expended so much effort and creativity and imagination in your creation, that since God designed you to be unique, that since God views you more as a one-of-a-kind work of art than anything else, can I remind you that billions of people have lived on this planet over the history of mankind, but there's never been one like you. Even if you're a twin or a triplet, there's never been one like you. Your fingerprints, your DNA, even your retina is completely different from anybody else that's ever lived because God went out of his way to remind you at every opportunity that you matter as an individual. You're not one of a group. You're not one of a clump. You're not one of a church. You're not one of a denomination. You're an individual, and you matter as a person, as a work of art to God. God values you. This book is about God's pursuit of a love relationship with you. And there are chapters in this book that are unbelievable in God's pursuit of you as a work of art, where he sends his only son to die on a cross so that you can become a part of eternity with God. That where I am, you may be also. God has reached and reached and reached and is reaching today to ensure the fact that your eternity is one that is spent with him. God wants you ultimately, the design he has for you on life is the ultimate design that you would be with him forever. And then he backs up and says this, but the choice is yours. I want you to be with me. I love you. I'm reaching toward you. I have sacrificed my son, but the choice will be yours. You were made for eternity. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says this. He made everything appropriate in its time. He has also set eternity in their heart. You were designed with eternity in mind. You were designed, and while there's an expiration date stamped somewhere on you where you are going to die, it is appointed into a man to die. We know that. None of us gets out of this thing alive. That's just the beginning. And God even stamped on our hearts a yearning toward eternity. I think that's what all of science and philosophy and religion is all about, to ascend somehow above this temporal, temporary uh, time frame that we're in and somehow reach up above us and touch what's eternal. I think that's what all those studies are about. And the thing that's cool about it is God put that in you. He put that in your heart that there would be a yearning and a leaning into eternity. The verse suggests that God made man's heart with a stamp of eternity so that there would be a dissatisfaction with the surfacey things and there would be a deep craving for what's eternal. There are moments in each of our lives that we know that there's just something more to it than what we're living here. That this can't be all there is. That there has to be something more than this. And there is, and the reason you say those things to yourself is because God stamped that into your very being that you would yearn for eternity. We know that life is brief. James says in his book that Life is like a vapor. It's here, and then it's gone. Some people have opted in their lives to do away with any thoughts of eternity. To do away with any thoughts of God. And they've decided to live for the now. They say this, let's eat, and let's drink, and let's be merry, for tomorrow we die. And if there's no God, and if there's no eternity then why bother? Why not just make the most of today? Let's get it over as quickly as possible with as much enjoyment as possible. And really the only solution to the tension that lies between the fact 
that we are in the temporal and that we are designed for eternity, that somehow we have to deal with the problems of this life and tomorrow you have to get up and deal with the stuff of this life and at the same time you're being prepared to live forever with God. The only way that we can deal with the tension of those two things is the fact that Jesus came and put on himself the title Everlasting Father, the designer, the originator of eternity. Wow. Eternity invaded time when Jesus was born. God creates us for eternity, and Jesus came to earth so that we would have the possibility of sharing in what is eternal. And this book shares much about who God is. This book des de describes the creation account at the beginning of this book. And the creation account reveals the existence of God and his power and his wisdom. But creation doesn't say much about the love of God or the grace of God. There's much in this book about the law. And that the law tells us that God is holy and that he's just and that he desires his people to be holy. But the law can't change a sinner's heart or control his motives and his actions. This book has much history in it. And history reveals in God, uh, that God is in events and that he shows that he cares about his people through these events. But even here, the revelation of history, you can't see the personal touch that we so badly need from God. It was sending his son to this earth and having what was eternal invade what was temporal that made the difference. And it wasn't a temporary visit. It wasn't a flyover. It wasn't a weekend stay. He altered the entire relationship between time and eternity upon his visit. Jesus wasn't simply born. The Bible says that he came into the world. It's a stronger term than him just simply being born. He came. There was purpose. There was design. There was a plan behind his arrival. He invaded time from eternity. And in John 6, 68, his words are words of eternal life. His actions all pointed to the eternal. He spoke as no man had ever spoken, and he lived as no man had ever lived before. His values were vastly different than his contemporary religious leaders of his day. Because he and because of that, he challenged the established religious system. Jesus looked at people through the eyes of eternity. And he never permitted himself to be shackled by temporal opinions. The sick weren't just sick. They were eternal beings that had a need in their life. An immoral woman came to Jesus one day while he was at the house of a Pharisee. And she knelt in front of him and she began to cry. And with her tears, she washed his feet and she dried his feet with her hair and then began to pour an ointment. And the Pharisee named Simon got upset in his spirit about the kind of woman that she was and that she was touching Jesus. And Jesus looked at Simon and he asked the most interesting question, do you see this woman? He didn't. He didn't see her the way Jesus saw her because Jesus saw her as an eternal being. Can I remind you today that when God looks at you, he's not looking for a reason to grind you up. He's not looking for a reason to hit you or to punish you or to destroy you. He's looking at you through the eyes of eternity. Jesus looked at a woman in front of him and saw her as an eternal being, not for who she was, not for what she had done, but what she was to become. To every one of you in this place today, God isn't just looking at what you are. He's looking at what you're going to be. God looks at you through the eyes of eternity. That should be the most encouraging thought that any of us have, that God would take time to look at us at what we can be and not just what we have been. That's what creates such an incredibly strong love that Jesus could die on a cross. 
allow himself to go through everything he went because he knew that it would purchase eternity. And he saw us for what we could be in all of eternity and made it possible for us to be there with him. Sinners were never outcast to Jesus. They were just lost sheep who needed a shepherd. The sick were not a threat or an inconvenience. They were just people who needed a physician. Almost everything that Jesus talked about, anything that he touched, it took on a new dimension because he's the father of eternity. He's the everlasting father. Ordinary bread and wine took on all new meaning when he put his hand upon them and spoke over them. This body, this bread is my body which is broken for you. This cup is a new covenant written in my blood. His disciples, when they were overprotective and little children were trying to get to where Jesus was and they were trying to protect Jesus and they drove the kids back, he just said, permit the little children to come to me. And as he held them and he lifted this, these children into his lap, he also lifted them to the childhood to the highest possible level. And he said in Matthew 18, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like one of these little children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus had the ability to take something that mattered as little as children and to elevate it to a standard by which we all must obtain childlike faith to inherit the kingdom of heaven. God made us for eternity. There's more to life, my friend, than meets the eye. But how do you and I hope to experience the eternal in this flesh and blood and living in this temporal time with the struggles and the hassles and the problems of our life, how do we honestly hope to experience eternity? There was a time when time and eternity met. Jesus came to earth and revealed the eternal and then he died that we might share in the eternal. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. You see, sin's the great obstacle to eternal life. And I want to tell you something about sin that you might not have thought about. Sin is not eternal. Sin had a beginning point, and it has an ending point. Sin is temporal. Sin will not exist forever. Sin hasn't been here forever, and it's not going to exist forever. God is eternal. Life with God is eternal. Sin is not. It's temporal. Sin is outside God, and because of that, it produces death. But God is eternal, and it produces eternal life, our relationship with him. Our nature is sinful. And because of that, we become strangers to this thought of eternity. It strains our mind. It's a well-known concept in all walks of life. Whether you're in a schoolyard and you're trading your lunches with a friend, or you're working on the stock market and you're trading stocks, or you're a salesperson or you're a car dealer, you understand the concepts that you never exchange something that has no value for something of great value. You never give away something of great value so that you can receive something that has no value at all. Why exchange sin that is temporal for a relationship with God that is eternal? Why would you grab on to momentary things, momentary pleasures? Why would you get so angry at God that you would write him off because of a problem that you've had? Why would you buy into the temporal and eliminate that which is eternal? Why exchange momentary for eternal life? These kinds of exchanges don't make logical sense, but the Bible is full of such, of such illustrations of people cashing in the eternal for something that's temporal. I want to show you one real quick. Opening your Bibles with me to Genesis. Genesis chapter 25. If you're in a church Bible, I'm on page 17. Two brothers. Two brothers, and they have a meeting. It's recorded in Scripture. 
and one is going to make a terrible deal and pick up something of very little value for something that is very valuable. And this is just one of many, many illustrations in Scripture. Starting in verse 29, Genesis 25. Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country famished. He said, Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. Jacob replied, first sell me your birthright. Look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is a birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. He gives up his inheritance. He gives up something of value, not just for his generation, but for generations to follow, over a bowl of lentil stew. Friends, that's a terrible trade. And we have people in our land that are exchanging things that are just that bad of a deal. That they are giving up an eternity with God over momentary pleasure over a desire to be the God of their own universe and to call their own shots, over a desire to be in charge instead of in submission, a char- and, and, and to be an owner instead of a steward, and they are cashing in something far more value than the momentary right of being in charge. Sin has pleasure, there's no doubt. Hebrews 11.25 tells us that. Talks about Moses, that he chose to be with God's people rather than to enjoy the pleasure of sin for a short time. The Bible never says that sin isn't fun. But at what cost? In economics, they teach you to go to the bottom line and to find out what the real cost of something is. Don't make a decision on sin based if it's fun. It is fun. At what cost? What's it going to cost you for momentary pleasure? What are you going to cash in when you're holding on to your bowl of lentil stew? What have you given up in exchange to have a bowl of stew in your life? We were created in the image of God. There's a hunger for eternity in our hearts that God put there. And until we do something about our sin... We can never share an eternal life with God. God solved the sin problem that you have and that I have by sending his only son to die on a cross for our sin. Time and eternity met at Calvary. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem, time and eternity met in a person. When he died at Calvary, time and eternity met as a price tag paid for sin. Religion can't do that. Your opinion can't do that. Your acquaintances can't do that. Your connections can't do that. Your money can't do that. None of those things can take away your sin and give you eternal life because every one of those things is temporary. We need Jesus who breaks into time from eternity to take away our sin. In order to become the father of eternity... He had to suffer on the cross. Our birth into eternal life required his death. And the gift of eternal life was not cheaply purchased. So how do I live today with this whole thing about eternity? What impact does this whole thing about forever have on the fact that tomorrow I'm going to the doctor and I am having a test read and I'm scared? What does this whole thing about eternity have to do with the fact that I cannot pay my PG&E bill? What does eternity have to do with the fact that I'm due in divorce court this week in a custody hearing? Jesus is the father of eternity. He lives now to give eternal purpose and quality to your everyday life. Sin is the great waster. Satan is the great destroyer. And in our world, most of our people on this planet have chosen to merely exist and not to really live life. What they live on doesn't satisfy. 
it will never last eternally. And a vast majority of people have selected substitutes. And substitutes are robbing them from the true experiences of life that God wants people to enjoy. You want to know the heart of God? You want to know the goal of God? Jesus said it himself in John 10.10, I have come to give them life and life to the full. Eternal life? Yes, he's going to take care of that. But this life was intended to be lived in a way that was satisfying and full. The events of everyday life take on new priority in the light of eternity. We all deal with problems and conflicts, issues, pain. We also deal with victories. We also deal with celebration. We also deal with good things. And the way that we deal with each of these is different when we understand that we are eternal beings. Eternity, a mind bent toward eternity, changes the way that you respond. Jesus modeled this kind of life. When Jesus got into some difficult situations, it was an eternal timetable that, that was obviously stated in response. You can't read the gospel without seeing a divine timetable that has to do with eternity and not just temporal situations that are being addressed. In John 7, when his enemies tried to arrest him, they found it impossible, and this is what's recorded, because his time, his hour, had not yet come. When the religious leaders wanted to arrest him while he was preaching in the temple, they failed because his hour had not come in John chapter 8. And at the climax of this whole story in the Garden of Gethsemane, as the soldiers came and the arrest was made and there was a betrayal and a kiss on the cheek, Jesus simply said this, Father, the hour has come. Jesus dealt with the tough times that way. And when there were times of celebration and there were times of victory, he said to his disciples in Luke 10, however, do not rejoice that the spirits uh, submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Don't rejoice at the temporal. Rejoice in the fact that you're going to live forever. David said in the Psalms, my times are in your hands. Does God still plan and guide us through life? Yes, he does. His plans include the eternal part of who you are. His plans include the temporal part of who you are in light of eternity. The way Jesus views you is completely framed by eternity. And the reason that Jesus came and died for you is your eternity. Jesus modeled how to live according to an eternal timetable. You need to take heart today because you were designed to live forever. And when God looks at you, he sees you as an eternal being, one of a kind work of art, and he values you enough to have a history in this book of continuing to reach for you and to reach to you and to reach to you. And today again, God is reaching to you. He's eternal. You're going to live forever. And God has designed it so that where he is, you could be also. Praise the Lord that he is our everlasting Father. Praise the Lord. Would you bow your heads with me, please? I personally understand this tension between the temporal and the eternal. This week when I asked God why, as I studied this lesson, I just felt... Uh, quite a bit of conviction about the questions that I had forced at God. And I came back around this weekend in some quiet time between me and the Lord, and I just said, God, I'm sorry for pushing you with a why question. What do you want me to learn? What do you want me to change so that I can be better prepared to live in eternity 
with you. If we could just remember in the events that we deal with that we're eternal and that God has an eternal perspective and that from the time you were created, you were designed and pushed toward eternity. It would change the annoyances, the problems, the issues of life. I spent a lot of time today talking about the fact that Jesus died for our sin. I spent a lot of time today talking about eternity with God in heaven. And I mentioned two or three different times that you have a choice in that. And I think it would be very incorrect of me to end this message without giving you an option, an opportunity to accept Christ as your Savior since it is your choice if you want to spend eternity with God in heaven or not.